Okay, so we're going to get started. This um, panel is about the, uh, the role of civil society, uh, which is a concept that we'll be diving into a little bit. We'd like to talk about uh, inclusion beyond buzzwords. What does inclusion really mean? Do, what, what does it entail? Uh, how does it work right, like in, uh, in real life? Um, we will be talking about how civil society organizations can help steer AI towards sustainable development goals. And I have uh, with me four uh, panelists that um, I chose because I have a lot of admiration for the work of all four of them. Um, I'm their biggest fan, so I'm happy to introduce. I'll go in order. Um, Milind Tambe, yes? We need, oh, we're, we're switching the slides. Okay, next slide. No, no, I'm, I'm in. Which one? The title? The title yeah. slide? The title slide. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, it's the title slide. Shh, we're whispering. Oh, this one. Okay. No, no, the, the title one. The title slide. The four speaker slide. We're gonna make it. Yes, that's the perfect it's one. Not it's not showing the, it's okay. Okay, I would like to introduce my first guest, Milin Tambe, who uh, is coming from uh, the University of Southern California. And um, I would like to start by explaining uh, why I'm so happy to have Milin with us today. Um, I found him when I was, uh, doing research and I, I discovered that uh, he decided to join the faculty of engineering with the faculty of social work. I, I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere else in any other university setting in other cities and I thought that's absolutely genius and I'm going to let him explain why he did that. Um, but uh, that's what grasped my attention. Most of his research is focused on developing more AI for good um, and uh, he, they work, uh, he works with citizens addressing pressing social issues. He uh, is the co-founder and co-director of the Center for AI and Society um, in Los Angeles. Milind has been awarded two very prestigious prizes this year um, and very well deserved, the John McCarthy Award. Um, again, I think that was pretty much awarded because of the work on AI for good and um, extremely well deserved. He also uh, received the AAA Robert Englemore uh, Award, which is quite the honor, um, and just published a book, AI and Social Work, and uh, he will be talking about the various um, projects. So um, I will introduce each speaker, and, uh, and then we can go ahead with the presentations. Um, Mike Skirpen from uh, Pittsburgh is here with us. Um, Michael, I found Michael when I was trying to find interesting ways of engaging citizens. His research that I, um, in I think what's, what's that, Google, Google uh, publications or, or something, and I found his, his text, and he does interactive um, uh, theater. Uh, and so I'll let him explain what he does, but that's how I found and the interest I got. So um, Michael is um, the uh, direct, executive director of Community Forge, which is a community organization in Pittsburgh, and special faculty at Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon. His focus is working on uh, in historically marginalized communities, and as I mentioned, uses art to engage with citizens. Kathleen Simonyo has come all the way from Kenya to be with us today, so we're really happy to have her. I met Kathleen in Geneva in May last year. I uh, was completely impressed by her work. Um, the reason why uh, Kathleen sparked uh, my little <laughs> happy spot <laughs> was uh, that she, um, it's really a grassroots movement that developed its own civil society organization and um, she um, is now the head of data science at Africa is Talking and the co-founder and organizer of Nairobi Women in Machine Learning. Uh, she's also part of Deep Learning Indaba, and you'll have to explain to me what Indaba is, sorry, steering committee. 
Uh, her focus is on computational perception and robotics and NLP for African languages. And last but not the least, Dong Wu is um, uh, an emerging future policy leader. He, his work is uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, he's a research fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. He has two masters, in one in China studies and the other one in political science. He's uh, blending his uh, experience and studies to focus on analyzing AI policies in East Asia and their implications for Canada. And there's a five-part report that is due on Chinese, Japanese, South Korean AI policies and again their implications for um, Canada. So please give a nice warm round of applause to welcome our speakers. And uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Milind to give his presentation. So everyone's going to do a, a brief uh, presentation of the work that they're doing, and then we're going to break into a panel discussion, and then we'll be um, uh, saving a little time for some uh, questions at the end. There's 10 minutes for questions. Sound OK? Or? Yes, wonderful. OK. Thank you, Milind. OK, well, uh, thank you for uh, organizing this workshop. It's a wonderful workshop. I've enjoyed the whole day uh, today. Thank you for all the wonderful speakers, and thank you for this uh, kind introduction. So I'm uh, Milind Tambe. So um, I come from the Center for AI and Society, a collaboration between our School of Engineering and School of Social Work. So the premise here is that with the recent advances in AI and multi-agent systems, we have a tremendous opportunity to use these advances towards societal benefit. And I'll focus on three areas in our center. We focus on uh, public safety and security, conservation, and public health. What ties these areas together is that viewing these problems as multi-agent systems, there's a key research challenge that cuts across these areas. How to optimize the use of limited intervention resources when interacting with other agents in these domains. And we've used computational game theory as a key tool in trying to handle these problems. With respect to public safety and security, the challenge is that we have a large number of targets to protect and limited security resources. How to schedule or plan or allocate these resources, taking into account a watchful adversary. We've contributed a new model called Stackelwork Security Games and developed new algorithms that are in use by security agencies such as the Federal Air Marshal Service in assigning air marshals to flights in the United States and also internationally such as patrolling in ports such as Singapore. With respect to conservation, the challenge is that we have large conservation areas to protect but limited number of rangers. A concrete example is work that we've been doing with Uganda Wildlife Authority in Uganda for the past several years. You heard a talk from my uh, former PhD student, Fei Fang, about this uh, this morning. The cha here, the model that we've contributed is called Green Security Games. The idea is that by taking past poaching data into account, uh, we can predict where poachers will set snares. And for the past several years, I've been able to show that we can remove a large number of snares and even get poachers arrested. And the model's being extended towards illegal fishing and trying to prevent illegal logging. A third area is public health. Here, we have to inform a large uh, number of people but have limited messaging resources. A concrete example is work we've been doing with homeless shelters in Los Angeles where we are trying to inform homeless youth about dangers of HIV. Rates of HIV amongst homeless youth are 10 times the rate of normal house population. We've shown that by harnessing the social networks of these youth, our AI influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information compared to traditional approaches. And we are now extending these approaches towards other public health challenges, uh, including malnutrition, uh, tuberculosis, and others. In all of these cases, coming to the theme of this uh, panel, interdisciplinary partnerships with government and non-governmental organizations are crucial. And to that end, we've really patrolled uh, with the Coast Guard in, in their boats in the Port of New York, for example, or really patrolled with uh, conservation agencies such as Panthera in uh, forests in Malaysia. Our students spend time in homeless shelters talking to homeless shelter officials or looking at primary health care centers uh, in India and visiting them and understanding how tuberculosis treatment uh, gets sent out. So this immersion is important in trying to understand what kind of data to really collect. 
uh, what kinds of problems to focus on, based on the basis of which we can then develop our predictive algorithms, our machine learning algorithms. This will allow us to separate out high and low risk cases. But the next step, of course, is prescription because we have limited intervention resources, where to apply them. That's where our planning, our game theoretic reasoning comes in. But we are interested in taking this one step further. So in all of our projects, we are very keen on taking this out into pilot tests in the real world. And this is important not only because we are interested in the social impact, but because it teaches us something about what might be wrong in our models and how we could improve them. And in some cases, of course, we're lucky and find a partner who can take this to scale. One concrete example of taking this to scale is work that we've been doing with the Smart Partnership, which is a global partnership of uh, conservation agencies such as World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, and others, to take uh, our software for predicting poaching attacks and patrol planning to 600 national parks around the globe. So this is work that's ongoing, and we hope that by uh, 2019 this software will be rolled out. Another example is work we've been doing with homeless shelters in LA. So we've just con completed a study with 900 homeless youth about spreading information about HIV and trying to extend it towards substance abuse prevention, suicide prevention, and others. So when our mayor talks about the humanitarian crisis we are facing in Los Angeles with the homeless population, with over 60,000 people who sleep on our streets, uh, we are really uh, grateful that with AI we can contribute to help citizens in our city. I'll make one final point. When we talk about AI for social good, it is important to step out of the lab and into the field. This is important in order to build the right kinds of interdisciplinary partnerships to understand the right kinds of problems to solve and um, understand what deficiencies exist in our models. So thank you. And uh, that's the book uh, that was mentioned, AI and Social Work. If you buy copies of the book, then from the royalties, I can take my PhD students out to a nice dinner. So I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Thank you. And we're now going to welcome Mike Skirpin. Thanks, everybody, um, and thanks to these really awesome panelists. I'm going to be a lot faster, just kind of give people a sense of what I'm actually doing. I'm the director of a community center um, that is near where I grew up, and it's in a neighborhood that has sort of been left behind in a lot of the development in Pittsburgh. Um, it has a lot of amazing assets and that I've uh, always wanted to give back to since it's really close to where I grew up, which was uh, part of the area of Pittsburgh that was very severely impacted by the end of the steel industry. Um, but then I also continue some of my work in engineering at Carnegie Mellon, primarily doing computing ethics. So uh, this is just a, a couple photos to sort of ground you in what I'm doing in the community. Um, so that building is a retired school that was abandoned um, and had been vacant for five years in a community that was really interested in seeing that school not get knocked down and not become a site of gentrification, a, a space where it would be like lofts or something on, inaccessible to the community. Um, we found it when we were thinking about putting an education nonprofit in this community and then found that the community was very, very passionate about this being uh, saved as a space. Um, and so we ended up buying it with a loan that was um, <laughs> a little bit of a challenge thing to get, but essentially this ended up taking me way off my path from applied machine learning um, that I was doing in graduate school and into just doing community development work. And so we there focus on equitable economic development, so we help uh, uh, local entrepreneurs get access to social capital and real capital um, as well as just training and, and readiness programs. Um, we also do youth empowerment work uh, and what we call neighborhood well-being work which is often building the bridges and breaking down the silos between communities that exist that create the uh, marginalization or make it even further. Um, and then so over in the university setting, I'm pushing for ethics and computing, and uh, I design curriculum for different professors to implement to add ethics into technical curriculum. Um, and so where a lot of this gets married, my sort of ethics side that's uh, technical and then this community development side is actually in my artistic practice. Um, so this is some photos from an immersive theater piece that I wrote while I was in graduate school called Quantified Self. Uh, and the goal was to create a space where technical 
technical experts as well as members of the public could have a meaningful way to talk and um, actually debate or show different perspectives on the ethics of technology development, in particular AI and data ownership. Um, and so we actually implemented about 10 real technologies that you could share your data with live um, and use as fake products in a company that you were experiencing a night when a whistleblower showed up at a public event and you kind of are at the heart of uh, a sort of corporate ethical dilemma and get the chance to talk about it in different spaces. And this was actually after multiple years of research of my own of learning that stories and scenarios are a really great place for multiple stakeholders to come together and explore ethics because you're not leaving this like higher ground of, oh, you're the machine learning expert and I'm just this person uh, who feels weird about it all. And instead it creates a symmetry where it's more about the felt experiences and the social impacts that are happening in the story and whether they were okay and whether the right decisions were made and what considerations should be made. So um, that, that's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No, that's okay. Do, do you want to? So we're going to welcome Kathleen. Uh, my name is Kathleen, as has been mentioned. I'm head of data science at a company called Africa's Stalking. I'm not going to dwell on my work there because I don't think it's uh, interesting stuff. But Africa's Stalking is a um, communication service provider with a focus on, with a focus on software developers. Uh, this just means that we build APIs and then software developers build front-facing applications. Um, our products are SMS, USSD, voice, payments, and airtime. So guys build all sorts of things using these products. Um, outside of that, I also co founded and co-organized the Nairobi um, Women in Machine Learning and Data Science community. I'm passionate about democratizing machine learning just because we've seen the effects of all sorts of solutions being taken from one um, context and transplanted to another without um, paying attention to the effects or the different nuances that come with different contexts. So just empowering people to with the technical skill to be able to implement their own machine learning um, solutions is something that I feel very passionate about. We started this community um, mainly because there was no such space back home. So out of a need for just to, for ourselves to gain technical skill to find peers who can aid our learning journeys. And we do this through monthly meetups. Um, we've done monthly meetups for the past two years. Um, through that, we've learned what works, what does not work. We've um, been playing around with different models. So outside of monthly meetups, we also have um, study groups, we have activities like hackathons, basically just stuff that is going to help the women in our community to number one, get the technical skill, number two, like I mentioned, get peers who can aid their learning journeys, and then number three, activities which they can engage in to just um, practice the skill, think through problems, and see how they can implement solutions to fix that. Um, I am also part of the organizing, uh, the steering committee for the deep learning in DABA, which much like the uh, women in machine learning community is just about democratizing machine learning, but it's just plugging into a wider network and connecting with people all across Africa. So we have a, an annual conference um, which takes place yeah, once a year, <laughs> um, an annual conference. And in addition to that, we have independently organized Indabas, which are organized by people who attend the main Indaba. So like last year, we had 13 Indaba Xs. Um, and it's really just nice to see all of this being able to be perpetuated. We're looking forward to supporting about 20 to 25 Indaba Xs in different African countries next year. And like this year, we had um, representation from 33 African countries at the Indaba. So it's also just, it, it's, it's nice to see the community grow to be involving other countries, even as we, you know, go into the age of AI and ML, to look back and see who is not here, how can we get them here, and yeah, oh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. And now, <laughs> and now I would like to welcome Dong Wu. Okay, uh, do we have any political scientists in the room? Anyone with a political science degree? 
Oh, yeah, thank you, Farah. <laughs> Two. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the role of civil society from the perspective of uh, a political scientist. So I've looked at a, uh, AI policies in East Asia, so China, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, and in doing that, I came across this book uh, called AI Superpowers, where Dr. Kai-Fu Lee talks about how China will be a leader in, uh, is or will be a leader in AI because there's not a lot of regulations that hinder uh, innovation and that there's a lot of data. And that's why, uh, and he talks about that dichotomy between innovation and regulation. And so, in, uh, and that's a, that's a narrative that we hear a lot, even here in Canada or in the United States, that we you know we need to support innovation, and you know uh, innovation is uh, shouldn't be hindered by other external concerns and such. Uh, this is an extreme picture, but bear with me. Um, so, I found the discourse from uh, from this book to be quite uh, troubling, because in, uh, the Chinese system is very particular in that the government. Uh, there is a very strong hierarchy between government and private sector. So the government is able to shut down uh, operations when there is a problem, and that's how they earn uh, the public trust. But in case of Canada or other Western countries, we do it through the rule of law. There is a procedure in which we, uh, we do things and we make decisions. And here the civil society plays a very, very important role in, by promoting, uh, promoting the, the opinions, the views, of, uh, of citizens, which is really diverse. It's basically a free market of opinions, but that's getting promoted to governments and, uh, and businesses. And in that, our government gets legitimacy. We, uh, we think that the government is the government of the people. And this is not so much the case in, uh, in East Asia. So, and more so, this is an issue as uh, everyone is thinking about coming up with AI policy for each government. In case of uh, Korea, Japan, and South Korea, they have all come up with very comprehensive AI strategy, which not only supports research and development, but they talk about how they're going to use AI for uh, national security, public safety, uh, all from a more centralized manner. Um, and, but then in formulating those policies, they acknowledge that there is a need to, uh, to address citizen concerns, public concerns, but because the civil society is so much weaker in China, Korea, and Japan, that knowledge is missing. And in that context, for uh, the, the strength of civil society that we have here in Canada and other parts in the Western world, it's really a strength. It's something that could really add value to, the tech, uh, to, uh, to AI innovation uh, that we have. So people come to Montreal, people come to Canada because we have really excellent researchers. But also, um, what I've heard from uh, from Koreans and the Japanese and some of the other foreign obs uh, observers is that they also find uh, Canadian value of uh, good governance and openness and diversity as another attraction because Canada wouldn't be able to compete uh, with, uh, say, China or the United States in terms of dollar amounts. But um, they find those values uh, to be appealing. And, in, uh, and I think that we, uh, we could enhance uh, the quality of our, uh, of, our, of our AI brand here in Canada by better integrating um, civil society voice into our policy frameworks and such. So that's my presentation. Thank you, dong -woo. Okay, so we've been um, using this, this word civil society, civil society organization. Can I see a raise of hand? Who's comfortable with the notion of civil society organization could define it in four words? Not me, I'm just, uh, no, no, because I must, no, okay, wonderful. Okay, so that introduces our first question. Um, what is a civil society organization? Everyone knows civil society could be a, a movement like Me Too, but what's a civil society organization? Is it a nonprofit? Are all nonprofit civil society organizations? Uh, so I'm going to pitch that question to my four panelists and see what we come up with. So I'll, uh, is this working? So uh, I'll keep my uh, answer uh, short. I guess in, in this case, for me, civil society organizations are uh, 
community organizations. These could be homeless shelters. Um, they could also be larger non-governmental organizations such as uh, wildlife conservation organizations, WWF, WCS. So in our work, when we talk about uh, collaborating with these uh, civil society organizations, it would be these local community organizations or these non-governmental organizations. I, yeah, I would say in what my experience with them is, I mean, you might think of big NGOs and big national organizations, but really I think of uh, small mission-driven organizations that might be for-profit social enterprises, they might be non-profits, um, but they're basically collective individuals that are in a community that are um, usually building some kind of organizational response to uh, a problem on the ground that they, they themselves have decided uh, it's time to solve or put resources into. Yeah, so in line with that, I think it's just, um, like he said, mission driven. Because um, the, there's a lot of gaps in society, stuff that the government is not thinking about, stuff that people who are um, in the private sector are not thinking about. So I'd say it's just that. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Uh, so I think the key word for me is uh, public good, uh, the idea. Uh, because private sectors have their own interest and government has its own interest. So uh, civil societies, they fill that niche. Uh, they, uh, they promote the diverse interest of the citizens uh, out there in society. Okay, and um, does anyone want to talk about their... Okay, we're going to just dive into the next question. Um, I'm curious to know what you think. How can AI scientists collaborate with civil society organizations to achieve sustainable developmental goals. And we might be using the word SDG, SDG a little bit, but uh, amongst the sustainable development goals, of course, there's climate change, uh, there's poverty, access to education, access to health, access to justice, um, gender issues. Uh, so um, in trying to achieve positive goals for SDGs, how can AI scientists collaborate with civil society organizations? And uh, you can answer how you feel comfortable. Milind, maybe you want to give it a start. So I'll f uh, emphasize the point I made, which is immersion in the domain, uh, that this work cannot be done by sitting in the lab and just doing work by ourselves. I'll give two concrete examples. One um, is we're working with a wildlife conservation agency in Malaysia and this is work that uh, Fei Fang also brought up uh, because she was a student with me then. And so she was uh, coming up with these uh, routes, patrol routes, uh, for patrollers to follow in the forest in Malaysia. And we would send the routes, and they said, this is not working. So why is it not working? The shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, which to us was extremely confusing. How is that possible? So how does the geometry, you know, world change in Malaysia that that's happening? So we flew down to M Malaysia, patrolled with the patrollers in the forest, and we suddenly realized that, yeah, shortest distance between two points when you're patrolling is not a straight line. You actually have to follow riverbeds and contour lines, on the, uh, basically f follow ridge lines and so forth so that you don't consume as much energy. This kind of insight cannot be drawn by just sitting in the lab because they aren't, you know, only when you get into the field and understand what's going on, that's when some of these insights become available. A second example is uh, work that was going on with our social work colleagues. And so I was listening to this conversation going on between a colleague of mine, a computer scientist, and a social worker. And so the computer science professor was saying, well, I don't understand, what is your objective? And she was really expecting a answer that said, well, here's a sum over n term, something, something, something. And the social, work, uh, social worker was saying, what's there not to understand? It is to make all the kids drug free. And, but, but the computer, but that's not the objective. The objective has to be something more concrete. So these kinds of things can only be if you really immerse yourself and understand what's going on, that's when. So, this, uh, so I guess going back to your question about partnerships, the key to me is really this immersion in the domain and getting out of the lab and in the field. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dong Wu. Okay, so, as a, uh, so this is the perspective as a non-technical person. So I feel, uh, 
I really believe that this is a this is not a technology that gets domained within the uh, that gets confined within the domain of a, a scientific field. It's uh, like for a for a non-practitioner like myself, I'm dealing with AI on a daily basis. This is becoming part of lives of people who are not necessarily in the field of artificial intelligence. So I really think that there is, an, uh, there is a need for scientists to be more public-minded about the work that they're doing and then be willing to, uh, be willing to engage with people who may not be as prof uh, proficient in speaking about this technology. And I think that's, uh, that shift in discourse is essential for, uh, for that collaboration. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I would say um, I'm going to wonder about how the collaboration, quote unquote, goes down. Um, and uh, I think that we have, as AI researchers and specialists, um, a lot of power and resources we're bringing to the table. There's governments and, and large foundations and companies making big investments in this and community organizations are the ones that really actually understand how to achieve the problem like how to make um, progress on these problems on the ground and often collaboration is kind of a people swoop in and say give us some data or tell us about the problem and then they go back to the lab and I think that collaboration is really starting at an even playing field and actually going into communities and building authentic relationships and finding out who the leaders of communities are and working with them in ways that give them decision-making power and that respect their time. Um, I see a lot of people coming into communities sometimes and even within the community center I work in and researchers and technologists want to come in and do some kind of collaborative research but they don't want to actually invest or, or put any resources into the organizations and these are often organizations that are working with very, very limited funding, um, people volunteering their time, people working two or three jobs in order to do their um, passionate community service work and these are also the people who can unlock the really authentic relationships and potentially, I know there's been other panels today about fairness and bias um, for instance and like if if we want to get better at framing problems and um, actually really doing work that is going to relate and resonate with people on the ground um, I think it actually starts with having those authentic relationships and making sure that the collaboration is a true collaboration the people on both sides in the community and in the research or corporate setting um, are being seen as people who have equal amount of knowledge and importance um, and it can't just be a sort of bespoke hey we want to work with you which really just means we want you to give us data for free or something like this. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. So, like Michael, when we ask how this can happen in terms of collaboration, I think about the practicalities, yeah? Because it's, it's quite possible for people in tech especially to just be siloed, to be sitting in their labs behind their computers, playing around with cool tools. So how do we get them aware to the fact that there's this whole world out here and your skills might be useful? So um, I don't know, maybe a creation of a platform of some sort where people can interact. Um, I've seen a, a website, I'm, I, the name escapes me, but it's, it's a bit like Kaggle where you put up challenges, except they're specifically for good. Yeah, And I think something like that would help if you can um, give a computer scientist or a machine learning engineer a very um, easy way to plug into what you're doing, that might be helpful. So creating platforms or just availing your data, talking about your problem, and then being able to iterate um, in terms of framing the problem to see, are we actually looking at the correct data? Are we um, approaching it from the right direction? So yeah, I'd go back to the technicalities of how that collaboration can happen. Okay, I'd like to maybe push the, the question um, a little bit uh, further. I was um, at the United Nations Thursday and, and Friday, and we were talking about the role of public institutions in, in supporting a positive uh, impact to technologies, and in, in my case, it was really more talking about uh, AI. And um, we, we had a long discussion, and I, I think it really goes down to the whole onboarding process, and. Uh, you know, if there's, if there's a platform, will citizens and civil society organizations reach out to those, those platforms? H how do you help them understand what their, the needs are, what the potential of AI could be for their, um, their needs? And, and even joining those two is not always obvious. I, I've worked with some nonprofit organizations who 
work really hard at identifying their need, but they forget to consult the machine learners, and the machine learners are like, well, you can't do anything with that data or that question. And machine learning doesn't apply to that. And on the other end, there's sometimes civil society organizations where like, my website's not working, so I'm not going to look into data analytics. So do you, do you in, in that perspective, do you have any experience or ideas to, to share in that, that process? Because Melinda, I, I know that you, you worked with uh, homeless community in, in Los Angeles. So in, in that process, there must have been something interesting. And, and Michael and Kathleen and Dong as well. Yes, OK. We're starting over um, there. OK, I can start. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't have any practical examples. But I, I was sitting at a session earlier this week, um, and a lady was presenting work on, I think, AI for children. Some uh, She's developing a course um, to for children to start getting acquainted with AI. And one of the examples she gave um, on the importance of this work is a little girl who was talking to Alexa and asked Alexa a question. And Alexa, I think Alexa said, I don't know. And she was like, oh, that's all right. I'll ask the other Alexa. And it, it, it shows the fact that she does not quite understand how the technology works. For her, she sees this as um, almost like a human. Like, you can communicate with it. It's uh, ask it a question, it gives you an answer, so yeah. Um, I, I don't see how we can fix this. Um, the way I see it, it, it needs to come from a, a preemptive position, yeah? A, a place where possibly everyone in whatever course you're undertaking does a unit in AI, so that you just understand the possibilities, how it can help you in your area, whatever it is, and that would make for more applied um, better application of AI and also um, collaboration, I think. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, I think that uh, it's about um, trying to build the readiness. Like, I think that people talk about, like, thinking about a platform, you would probably mm -hmm. frame that as an opportunity. We're going to create an opportunity for organizations to express their need to AI researchers or companies or whatever. Um, and I think that often, whenever people are talking about creating these opportunities, they assume that people on the other end are ready to meet the opportunity exactly as it's gonna be delivered. So like a really good example of something I saw in interacting with some community organizations in Pittsburgh was they were doing a bunch of housing development and they said, well, we're gonna leave 20 houses, for instance, that are gonna be affordable housing in this really nice new development. Um, and they, but they didn't fit, like plant the seeds in the community of letting people know that like these were going to come available, and then suddenly they came available, and they said they contacted a couple organizations, including ours, and said, "Okay, can can you get people to move into these houses?" And it's like moving is a huge process. We're going to need months to talk and find the right families that actually are ready to make this transition. Um, and then in the end, they ended up selling 17 of the units because they were sitting on their rolls, and they only ended up three ended up going to communities, but because they didn't have any preparedness on the ground. So I would say something similar if you want to do some kind of effort and create an opportunity, like kind of similar to what Kathleen's saying, I would say like start it by going out and actually creating maybe some community modules on the possibility of machine learning for good or AI for good and actually helping community organizations know what the potential is and then maybe six months after that open up the actual prize or the you know competition now for people to enter their ideas and actually have some people out there thinking about it as opposed to opening it up and then being like, why aren't small organizations working on youth nonviolence uh, applying? Because they probably have never thought about AI and they're not at all exposed to this problem or what the framework of solving problems through this lens is. Um, and so I think starting with educating people and being very intentional about that would create a lot better results on the other end. Thank you. So uh, in our experience for the past uh, 10 years or so, we've been working with these agencies and putting out software that they eventually end up using. But every meeting or every first meeting, first set of meetings always starts out with the uh, users uh, sitting with their you know, arms folded like this and saying, you know, we have decades of experience in whatever task that they're doing. We have decades of experience. For example, our first application was with airport police in improving uh, their allocations. Like, we have decades of experience in uh, you know, doing our job. What can your AI system possibly provide that we don't already know? Or we have decades of experience uh, you know, 
patrolling with these boats in the port of New York. What can you professors uh, sitting in uh, USC tell us that we don't already know? So that's always the first uh, line of response. And it takes time to build up trust via transparency of the program to you know, through sort of explanations and so forth to come to a point where finally they begin to understand, yes, this is providing some new insights that is complementing what they already know. Uh, it's not a threat, but it's a, it's a decision aid that's helping them out. And it's, you know, th there's a beautiful incident where um, uh, one of our postdoctoral researchers was working with uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department trying to improve collection of, uh, you know, trying to check for people who travel without tickets on trains in LA. So the first meeting was exactly like this. You know, we don't need you to the last, after uh, exercise was conducted and we showed that uh, this software was really useful, to the officer going and hugging the postdoc and saying, this is really great software. <laughs> and so th there's this big transformation, but it, it can't happen overnight. There needs to be this process of trust that often gets built up. Now, you can't do this at scale, uh, but for the first application, first innovative application, uh, it seems like that's the process that we've had to go through. And once, once the first domino falls, then, you know, throughout that organization or so forth, then, uh, you know, then it's very easy. But the first one is always, it seems somewhat difficult. So I, I understand that there's, there's social dialogue is extremely important, building trust, education is extremely important. Um, I'm going to move on to the, the next question. We got into a little bit of um, semantics uh, while we were discussing. Um, if I say development of AI and implementation of AI, depending on what field you're in, you might go into very, very different directions. Um, so I thought if I add social implementation of AI, is it a bit clearer? And we were still going into very different directions. So I'm going to let my panelists, uh, maybe I can start with Dong Wu, who's in uh, more the policy, uh, politics, and social science uh, uh, perspective of the, the question, get the ball started on what's the difference between development of AI and implementation of AI. Okay, so as a, again, as a non-technical person, um, the division is a, a little clearer to me because development is what engineers and scientists do, and uh, deployment or uh, implementation is uh, the part of uh, the technology that we actually see on our day-to-day -day lives. So uh, I'm thinking about the actual use of AI for deciding the, uh, <coughs> the parole length or uh, the use of AI for uh, home speakers and such or job screening. So uh, that's implementation. Uh, that's impl implementation to me. So when uh, technology is visible in a sphere that's not entirely technical. And, and I think the fact that we, uh, we're talking about implementation and development uh, in that sense, uh, partially at least, it points to the, uh, the importance of um, thinking about AI governance because it, uh, it just points to how pervasive this technology is going to be and how there's going to be a need for government to get in and uh, at least provide uh, some sort of guideline on how we should be engaging with, uh, with this technology because it really touches on issues of public good. When we talk about the development and then the deployment, I think in, in very technical terms, because that's my background, I, I actually just see it as me sitting on my laptop, deciding what features of the data make sense, training a model, and then deploying it, and then, hey, I'm done. But it's, it's a very narrow view, because it doesn't take into account the fact that, okay, you've deployed it, now this thing exists, and it's interacting with the real world, and it's making decisions, and it's affecting people. So I do think that the social aspect of it is something that we need to interrogate more and then come up with um, frameworks for deciding even, should this be deployed? Is it ready to be deployed? If, have we thought about everything that could go wrong in addition to all the things that we think it is going to do right? Thank you. I would actually maybe even just add, in order to create the clarity in my mind, I would add actually another piece of semantics that then I think clarifies more, which is AI design, which I feel like there's kind of three phases where you have 
design, which is deciding how the problem is going to be framed, um, how a person is going to interact with it, who are the end users going to be, are, is there going to be a human in the loop, is it going to be fully automated, um, and maybe even starting to think about the transparency requirements, um, is, there, is there a lot of due process or liability, things like this, and things that we could bring in a lot of social and outside expertise in that design. And then you get into development where it is, to me, yeah, very technical. I'm just thinking about like, well, which model am I gonna use? Um, now, hopefully, hope I've gotten from my designers good recommendations on data sources, uh, and that's like in an ideal world that, you know, making me aware of biases, making me aware of limitations of my data, and now I'm actually doing the development process to build accuracy, and then in deployment, we're back out as um, uh, do you, Dong, Dong, Dong Wong was saying, yeah, Dong Wu was saying, uh, that it was now you're talking about the government or you're talking about uh, an agency that's now actually got to like put this in a bureaucratic process or put this in their processes, um, which now is going to take some kind of final adaptation. But I think that uh, where I get confused with these semantics is I'm thinking about, well, development has all these other components, and when you say implementation, do you mean like coding implementation or do you mean social implementation? So I do think adding social helps, but uh, for me, if I add this design layer, it actually helps build, break it up a little bit more into like design, development, deployment. Um, Cool, thank you. Milin, did you have a... So, I, I mean, I'm in agreement there's the phase where the software gets developed in the lab and there's the actual deployment in the field. And uh, certainly we have to be careful about the negative uh, implications. You deploy something and it didn't work out the way it was. There's some sort of a bias and so, so forth. But I also wanted to point out sometimes you deploy things and there's a positive outcome that you didn't anticipate and that's a sort of a good thing where an AI system removed a bias that human beings were bringing to the table. And so, for example, in the work uh, that we were doing with homeless youth, uh, the software was recommending youth that people were ignoring. These were people who, within the homeless community, were isolated nodes, people who were being ignored as peer leaders to spread influence that the AI system picked up on. And by giving that attention, not only did they spread messages effectively and so forth, but it turned out they actually changed their life around it. Uh, they got more stable housing, more stable jobs. And so it was sort of an unanticipated positive outcome. And it's also important to sort of follow up on in the deployment phase, both the positive and the negative, and, and both, both can happen. We are often focused on the negative outcomes uh, in deploying app, but sometimes really interesting positive things happen uh, that are unanticipated as well. Oh my, I think we're gonna run out of time because I, yes, I agree there are risks and there's a lot of po potential, positive potential. And then the next question normally would have been how can we make sure that there's more of that positive potential being deployed? But I'm going to, I think I have like about, we have a, sh a quick drill question. And then we're gonna uh, pass the uh, floor to for questions if you wanna get ready if you have some questions. Um, Okay, so there's a limited, there, um, Element AI, Jean-François Gagné did a research and pointed out that there's 22,000 AI researchers in the world. That's, that's really not a, a lot. So I think he was kind of counting maybe only PhDs, but still it, there's, there's definitely a limited um, amount of AI talent in the world. So given the, the, um, the, its scarcity, is there a social responsibility for AI scientists to share their expertise to achieve sustainable development goals? On to you. Who wants to go first? I think uh, we need to start with the scientists first, and then um, this kind of seems to me like um, asking whether are you for capitalism or socialism. I, I definitely do not think. Okay. So they do have a social responsibility, but then again, you cannot tell them you have to do this because we each have our own free will. I can choose to use my skill for profit or not. Um, I think perhaps the way forward is to suggest that um, companies that have access to this talent or that have this talent say something like, hey, maybe one day in a month you concentrate on a project that's for social good. It's, it's common knowledge that Google does this with their employees in terms of them getting to spend a certain amount of their time on pet projects and they've gotten products out of that. So maybe it's just a, a matter of saying, okay, you've got this skill, the world is in need of it, it's in short supply, so how about you just dedicate part of your time to something that you care about? Yeah. True, thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with Kathleen. It's, I mean, how do you force it? But, you know, I'm, uh, I guess, biased in this way. I made that choice of, like, leaving a very profitable sector to go and be in a community um, and be engaged in building relationships and bridges in and out of that community for, for good to happen. Um, and I can say, like, in only a year of doing that, I already see how bringing, you know, my... Um, skills and a passion to people that already there's a lot of lives changing right around me so to me that's like way better than a better salary um, and and it I think that the impression would be like well does that mean your career's dead and what did you do why'd you get all these skills and it's like no it's not actually because this talent pool is so limited if people are out in the community I personally think companies will go out to you and they'll figure out ways they can work with you because uh, I mean, that's what I'm seeing. I still have people pinging me about projects and about all kinds of things. It's not like they were like, oh, you went into the community, therefore you're dead to me. No, it's like you still have a particular skill set and we want to find people who are doing that. So I actually think there's a lot of power that AI researchers have and they can make that choice if they'd like and it's probably good for other people. Well, I'm, I'm mostly in agreement with what's been said. It's certainly very important uh, for us as AI researchers to bring AI to those who have not benefited from it, for example, in the global south. Uh, it's also important for us to bring, uh, to participate in interdisciplinary partnerships in order to bring benefits of AI because we ourselves can't do the job. But um, we can't force it, certainly. And so I'll leave it at that in the interest of time. Um, so I don't disagree. Um, I, uh, I feel like if we rely on the goodness of the people, then, uh, then we often get into trouble. So we could have a really nice American president, but sometimes we could have someone who is not as nice. So we can't really depend on the goodness of people to things work out. Um, and I think uh, that's a policymaker perspective. So while it's great that uh, people like Mike is doing uh, excellent work in community, we shouldn't rely on that. We should create policy framework in which we produce more uh, AI uh, practitioners or uh, citizens who are more AI literate, and also uh, maybe policy that, uh, that provides more funding, more support for people who are willing to go into no, uh, non-for-profit. And, you know, I look at uh, AI policies in South Korea, China, and Japan, and I say that it's really comprehensive. And when I say that it's comprehensive, it's really, really comprehensive. So uh, the Chinese are testing out uh, AI curricula at the a level of elementary school. Like it's a pilot program, but they're testing that out. Um, they call it AI, but I, I, uh, I'm thinking that it's a coding program. But uh, it point, uh, and South Koreans are also talking about integrating AI education into hi uh, high school curriculum as well. Universities are talking about creating specialized AI program where you, uh, you become an expert in uh, using AI in a specific uh, sector. So you don't have to be a PhD graduate, but uh, you'll be proficient in working in a smart factory where AI is being used. So talent, issue, I think with time, it'll, it'll get better. But uh, we, sh uh, we could support that a little better through policy because relying on the goodness of people, it can be really, really dangerous. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I'd like to um, thank the speakers and uh, maybe open the floor to questions. Do we have a yes? Uh, thank you so much for the great panel. I was wondering, I'm very passionate about uh, the social science approach to action research as an approach to understanding the process by which algorithmic systems are used in the socio-technical context in which they exist. And you kind of talked about this already, like we, we need to think about trust. And, but this action research field aims to promote trustworthiness over general, generalization. Right, but as AI engineers, we are trained to um, score algorithms based on how well they generalize. Um, and I was wondering uh, how, uh, what's your perspective on how, could, how should we go about developing metrics to think about even measuring something like trustworthiness so that in the future we can incorporate this sort of comparison between uh, structurally, like comparing algorithms. Thank you. Okay, one of you want to address this? Uh, <clears throat> so very quickly, I think what you're pointing out uh, 
is an issue I see we face sometimes in publishing, certainly in AI conferences, is that we value generalization, like you're saying, algorithms that are general purpose and so on and so forth, whereas these are applications that we are trying to put out there that have impact. And it, uh, there's a tension there in being able to publish this work because on the one hand there is a, uh, you know, there's the need to publish these general purpose results versus this. So, for example, at AAAI this year, we led a track, AI for Social Impact, that tried to get at this issue, trying to encourage research which values not only the general purpose algorithm, but uh, clever data collection, clever pilot experiments, uh, in order to see the value of the work that's done, uh, model, you know, modeling choices and so forth. And so we have to engage uh, as a community in these sorts of exercises in order to encourage uh, uh, people to be able to publish in, in prestigious venues without necessarily emphasizing just, just the algorithmic improvement, but also the impact that it achieves in the real world. Are there any other? No, I don't think I see anyone. OK, so I, yes? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, hi. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for discussion. It was really interesting. I want to know that how we can increase um, uh, awareness and interest in public, in uh, AI, among public that have no background in AI. Because people that have background in AI, they, they usually search and increase their knowledge. But people without any education in AI, how we can actually engage them, how we can increase their knowledge in the field of AI. Yeah, I think that um, this starts one strategy. I mean, I could think of a number of strategies that are all going to actually have something to do with going and creating community programs that are actually about creating educational opportunities. They might actually require some kind of even prerequisite, working with someone who has a relationship in the community, um, or having some even prerequisite courses and investing in actually having some intro to CS or stats or math courses. Um, and I see, you know, I can say from the our community center, it, it took a little bit of time, but you know, even after six months of just us kind of chatting about this stuff with kids and uh, slowly the adults in the community getting to know us, people are suddenly like, wait a second, I, do you guys, have com you guys have computer courses? I know some of you guys do computer stuff, and it's like, oh yeah, well, we'll design them around what you guys want, and, um, and now we actually have a lot uh, going forward on that. But I think that one of the places I see as an opportunity to meet that challenge is actually in the way that universities do uh, their like, broader impacts and outreach on their grants. Uh, grants require broader impacts and outreach. Um, uh, I'm not super impressed with how these are right now. Um, they could actually potentially put some budget into having a community liaison, hiring someone in the community that could help figure out where these gaps are, someone who actually builds the four-year, five-year relationship with someone, um, and then actually uh, deploy classes and things that are very targeted at places where you have those relationships and trust. Um, I definitely think that that would work, especially if it was done over the course of like more than six months or a year where you first started with the trust building and then put the classes in once you have the relationships. I think it could work really well. Yeah. Um, again, I'm just going to say the same thing. It's, uh, it's going to be government again. Um, so for a non-technical person like me, uh, like in the policy world, everyone is trying to break into AI and blockchain because the government says that they are they're interested in pursuing it. So for example, the government of Canada hosted a policy proposal competition about, a, uh, about six months ago, and then the requirement was uh, doing something in, uh, by making a proposal using AI or blockchain. So maybe it's a buzzworthy thing, but it really ga uh, gathers a lot of attention within academia that's not necessarily aligned with a, um, like the field of artificial intelligence, machine learning, computing science. And, if, uh, and when I look at East Asian policies, they are comprehensive and they provide a very concrete vision that the government will be behind in supporting this technology. So the companies and citizens, they become aware and that they, uh, they want to get into it somehow. So maybe that same strategy is not going to work exactly the same here in Canada or the United States, but then the leadership uh, saying that this is going to be you know, the fourth industrial revolution, something that says, 
uh, impactful as uh, the first in, uh, industrial revolution and articulating a vision in which the technology is being used, is going to be used, I think that's going to be helpful in you know, uh, raising awareness because uh, it has worked in, um, in East Asia. If you read a South Korean newspaper, there is not a single day uh, where artificial intelligence is not discussed in one way or the other. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to, to conclude, I think, um, uh, based on your uh, question, Priya, there's really many different ways and channels and therefore specialties, expertise, disciplines, and people. There's going to many different ways. There's digital literacy programs, there's education programs, there's many different ways of onboarding the population. We can go through the arts like Michael and other artists and like Luba Aliat, I think she's just like in one of the other rooms over here. Uh, there's many different ways of engaging citizens and it goes uh, pure outreach, we're just calling them, talking to them, giving them insight. And I'll have to just plug in my conference very quickly, which is called AI and a Social Mission. Uh, one quarter of the participants are civil society organizations. The other 25, 30% are AI scientists. Then we have social innovators in the room. So really, you know, getting together, learning how to work in multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral teams is extremely important. Uh, not be uh, and, and art is a beautiful way because it's not intimidating. Anybody will feel engaged by public art, and we can start start the conversation that way. Um, so I would like to thank, from the bottom of my heart, Milin Tembe for being here today, Mike Skirpen, Kathleen Siminu, and Dong Woo Kim. I really appreciate and thank you for being here.